Well, before I get started, just a couple of important remarks. So the first one, that's kind of an apology, but when making these slides, I was pretty hungry. That's going to become apparent as I go along. Uh, the second one, uh, if you're my age or older, I would suggest stepping forward a bit. I'm going to show some code. Um, up to your eyesight, uh, how much you're going to see. With a raise of hands, like is everyone at least somewhat proficient with Python? Like raise your hands if you are. Okay, that's a good portion. If you're not, that's okay. Uh, there is going to be like a bit of a coding section in between, uh, a live demo. Um, but like the specifics don't matter that much. It's more like the paradigms and the methods behind it. Um, so going back to the fact that I was hungry. So if you were to Google this six months ago, that was May 2024, um, cheese not sticking to pizza. Um, you would expect to get like cooking advice. Your oven needs to be at a certain temperature or maybe your sauce is too watery, I don't know. Um, but at the time, if you were to Google it, uh, the number one advice you would get is that you should probably mix about an eighth of a cup of non-toxic glue into your sauce um, to get the cheese to stick to the pizza, which makes sense, I guess. Um, not sure it's going to be delicious, but, you know, thank you, AI, for the advice. Um, this is, I guess, a pretty common example. This is a funny one, um, but we've all seen, like, AI missteps uh, along the way. These are all like brand new technologies and it kind of makes sense for them not to be like bulletproof and absolutely perfect. Um, but we as engineers, we strive for that quality, right? We want to build something that others can rely on. Um, my name is Oz Katz. I'm the CTO uh, and co-creator of an open source project called LegaFS. Uh, you can check it out on GitHub if you want. This talk is not going to be very LegaFS focused, um, although there is a section about it. Um, I'm going to talk about reproducibility in AI and why that matters. Um, if you're making pizza or not, you should probably care about it. Um, and we're kind of going to try to reproduce what happened to Google, right, with that very strange answer, and then try to figure out how to use reproducibility in order to ensure we have higher quality. So why did Google suggest uh, glue on a pizza, right? That, that's, even if our LLM is not the most clever, that's probably the wrong advice to give. Um, and if we try to break it down, that very, very complex machine is essentially a very simplistic function, right? Um, so we have some form of logic. That logic, we feed something into it. We get back a response. That something, uh, in our case, is going to be all the logic that is required in order to run that LLM, right, that Google is running. So it involves our training code, right? If this is the foundation model like it is for Google. This might be the actual like, code used to train the model itself. Um, and if you're building like a RAG pipeline, this could be the pipeline, right? Whatever you're fitting into it, the parameters, um, whatever embedding algorithm we're using, um, and also the environment we're running this in, right? So if I'm using a, a specific version uh, of my dependencies, Upgrading, downgrading, that could give us different results, right? And all of this, this is kind of our logic. Into that black box, we typically feed data, right? And that data is essentially our LLM, our application, is only ever going to be as good as the data that we train it on and the data that we pass on to it. Um, so if we're doing fine tuning or if we're building retrieval augmented generation uh, applications, we're passing data into an existing model or we're building data on top of what it was already trained on. Um, or in the case of foundation models, this could essentially be like the entire internet or like vast amounts of data. The outcome, of course, would be to put glue on the pizza, right? That's the response that we're getting out of that LLM. Um, so why did Google suggest putting glue on the pizza? And the answer dates back 12 years ago. Um, like anything on the internet, it starts with a random troll uh, on Reddit. Um, someone asked on Reddit what to do if the cheese slides off too easily, um, and the person responded very seriously, I would recommend mixing about an eighth cup of Elmer's glue uh, with the sauce. So it's nice of Google to remove the brand name um, and replacing it with just non-toxic glue, so feel free to use whatever glue you have at hand, I guess. Um, so in that case, we had Gemini, which was very, very sophisticated and advanced, being fed 
silly data in order for us as the end users to get a pretty bad result. Um, so let's try and recreate something along those lines. Uh, let, let's build our own AI application. So this is what we're going to build. Um, I'm going to be using data that's coming from Project Gutenberg, um, which those of you who are not familiar, it's a really cool project. It's a community-driven effort to essentially digitize as many books uh, as there are available to humanity. Um, this will be our input. I'm gonna take some like, uh, unlicensed or like common uh, public licensed uh, books. We're going to fit it through Langchain, essentially taking the data, saving it in a format that we can actually use, chunking it, embedding it, putting it inside a vector database, uh, in this case, just the one running locally, uh, and then using OpenAI to build uh, a RAG pipeline on top, fitting this information into OpenAI um, in order to respond to questions that we ask it. All right, so we'll get the ability to ask questions about these books and get back answers. Um, I'm going to try to do this live. Uh, I built uh, a small Langchain demo. So actually, let's start with the command line. Um, what could go wrong? I'm running code from my laptop on conference Wi-Fi that needs to talk to AWS, to LegoFS Cloud, and to OpenAI uh, over the Wi-Fi here. So wish me luck. So our pipeline is actually pretty simple, so maybe let's start by going over that. So excuse all the imports. We'll, we won't uh, spend too much time on those. So I'm using uh, GPT, uh, just one of the cheaper models that they have available. Um, as mentioned, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna download a bunch of documents. In this case, I'm not downloading directly from Pro Project Gutenberg. I took some of the data and put it on an S3 bucket to make my life a bit easier. Uh, I'm going to use the S3 directory loader from Langchain. Uh, just loading whatever is available under some prefix in that bucket, and then storing it locally uh, just as the document representation that Langchain uh, knows how to work with. So that's step one, that's kind of our load. Then we want to be able to take those documents, we want to be able to chunk them, um, and to create embeddings for them and store them inside our vector database. Uh, that would be our uh, building the retriever. Next one would be uh, when we actually want to ask that application a question, uh, we're gonna build a retrieval chain in Langchain using our system prompt, which is just a very generic one you can see here. Fitting it uh, our human's input, uh, just a question, and getting back information from our retriever, which stores all the information about the books, to get back responses about these books. Um, so because this is a uh, conference Wi-Fi, I skipped the step of actually doing the data retrieval itself. Now you'll tell me whether or not this is legible also in the back. Raise your hand if you can read this. Thank you. So inside books, I have a bunch of classic literature all stored in JSON format. This is the Langchain representation. Um, and inside index, I have just a vectorized representation, the embeddings that we created um, of those specific objects. Okay, now I can run my chain. Ideally, all these steps would happen in Kubeflow. I'll go back to Kubeflow when we talk about how to reproduce those results. Uh, but now I'm just running it through the command line to make my life easier. Um, so let's ask a question. So let's ask, who is Wendy? Right, we saw that we have Peter Pan uh, as one of the examples here. Let's see if it's able to recognize that. So Wendy is a character from Peter Pan, uh, nurturing, motherly, takes care of Peter Pan and the other boys. That's great. Um, let's see if Wendy can cook. Uh, maybe not a pizza, maybe something else. Um, so what, what food does Wendy serve? So this would be our non-toxic glue. So apparently, Wendy is really good at chicken sandwiches. Um, the breakfast baconator is one of like her staple dishes. Um, yeah, I guess Peter Pan would enjoy that, being a child. So obviously, trying to mimic uh, what we just saw with uh, Gemini messing up, this is the problem, right? Now we have the problem, now we need to fix it. So I'll go back um, to our slides. So, Wendy's making burgers now. 
why is when we make making burgers. So if you look back at the input data that we fed into and these uh, into the, our algorithm, we'll see that books also accidentally contains Wendy's menu, which I took off the internet, um, which is a bit confusing, I'd admit that. So fixing the problem should be pretty straightforward, right? So we can just go back, remove it from our database, remove it from that intermediate representation. You just saw those JSON files. Uh, and potentially from my S3 bucket as well. Um, we don't want to wend this menu in there. Uh, I don't even know under what license they released the Wendy's menu, so I don't know if I can use it. Um, so we, we can start with that, right? We'll remove the, the menu. Uh, I'll rerun everything. You guys would see that she's no longer uh, known for her Baconator, and we're all happy. Um, but the fact is that's probably not good enough um, because even if at this point in time Wendy's no longer serving burgers, we really didn't solve the problem, right? We don't know what caused the menu to appear there. Probably a human error, maybe someone copied it by mistake, we don't know. So it just as might, might as well just happen again tomorrow. Um, we haven't done anything to actually prevent this from happening again, right? Let's imagine instead of just 10 classical books, we have uh, a whole bunch of documents in my enterprise. Um, how do we stop this from happening again? Um, and also, we don't really have a feedback loop, right? How do I test and validate continuously that I'm not fitting junk into my model, right? And, and this is where reproducibility matters, right? How can I rerun the same thing, get back the same results to make sure that what I'm testing actually represents what users are getting? Um, so for that, let's adjust. Let's make one slight difference. So the first one, I'm going to look at the data side. Later, we'll talk about the code. But first, let's focus on the data. So instead of loading data from just an S3 bucket somewhere that anyone can change whenever they want, uh, let's introduce another component. Uh, in this case, I'm using LakeFS. Ideally, any type of version control system for the data would work here. Um, LakeFS was pretty much designed to do this, uh, but there are other tools available. Um, so I already created a repository inside LakeFS. As you can see, hope you can see, this is backed by some storage, in my case, on S3. This could be any type of cloud storage. Um, and currently, there's no data here. So first step, uh, we should probably import our existing data. Um, so let me just grab some data from S3. This is our project Gutenberg Books. I'll put this in my repository and say imported books from S3. That's going to be my commit message for introducing my original data into the repository. Um, in general, LakeFS doesn't store the actual data. It just creates pointers to the objects that the data uh, contains. So I can see that I now have magically a data directory, within that a books directory, and here uh, all these nice books and also Wendy's menu, which we know we probably don't want. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to tactically fix the problem, which is just to delete this object. Original file is still in the S3 bucket. I just deleted LakeFS's link to it. Um, I'll commit this change. So LakeFS knows that this specific book was removed. Right, this in, removed Wendy's menu. And just commit that. And now my main branch, uh, the latest commit on that, no longer has the issue that we just saw. Okay, so. Now I need to adjust my code. I don't want to read data from S3. I want to re read from the main branch on LakeFS. So in order to do that, I'll say, I already have a branch prepared. Um, and if I do a diff, you'll see that I'm replacing my S3 directory loader with the LakeFS loader. This is also part of the Langchain community repository. Um, my download step now doesn't just take a bucket and a prefix, it also takes a reference, right? So whenever I'm reading data, I know that I'm reading from a specific version of that data, right? If I ever want to go back and rebuild the same thing, as long as that reference doesn't change, and LakeFS can guarantee that, I know that I'm always going to get back the same results. So I'm changing from the directory loader to the LakeFS loader. Uh, and just passing on the right arguments to make sure that I can pass a ref onto my chain. That's pretty much the, the bulk of it. So let's run this again. So let me clear my existing data. 
So the first step would be to extract. This is the part that actually reads from LakeFS and downloads all these books uh, onto my local machine. Let's try to see if we can see this live. So this would probably take a few seconds on internet Wi-Fi. So going back to my code, I, I can see now that both the extract step, but also if I was to use something like Kubeflow to orchestrate this pipeline, which I probably should, um, now also takes a source reference. Okay, and that means that if I was to run this, let's say, as a daily job, an hourly job, or triggered by some event that happens in the system, I'm always required to pass not just which version of the code I'm using, right, which Kubeflow lets me do automatically, um, but also I have to specify which version of the data I want to use. All right, so if I'm not using the CLI or just a YAML file that gets passed to it, I'm actually codifying that pipeline. Um, I always have to pass that source reference when I'm running my, and in this case, uh, extract and load phases. If I was to do maybe fine tuning or actually just building a whole brand new model, I would repeat the same steps, right? There, the input data might be a bit bigger, um, but all the same logic applies. In order for it to be reproducible, I have the code in Git, I have the data in something like LakeFS. Um, okay, let's see what I get here. Oh, I was in the wrong deer, sorry about that. Okay, it looks good. I don't see a Wendy's menu. So let's do our load phase. Let's give this a few seconds. Now, ideally, when, when I finish this, I'll be able to rerun those same questions, this time not getting information uh, about Baconators. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad. That's up to you and how hungry you are. So going back to our chain, um, let's see that this completes. Go Wi-Fi Go. Let's see if something's already created. No index yet. Obviously, this worked perfectly 10 minutes ago right? yes. on the same Wi-Fi. Ah, there we go. OK, so now I can ask the same questions. Let's do this, so who is Wendy? Wendy is still a character from Peter Pan. Um, but what food does Wendy serve? Yeah, so breadfruit, yams, coconuts, things that I, I guess make a bit more sense than a Baconator. So we fixed the problem. How do we actually prevent this from happening again? So going back to our slides. So. The first thing we probably want to do is just like for our code where we have automated testing, we can do the same for our data. So we, we can define main as a protected branch for the data itself, uh, introduce data on another branch, and then run CI CD steps to make sure that we're only ever merging data that passed whatever quality criteria we have. All right, so it could be just a simple check to see that the word Baconator is not contained within. Um, but it could also be checks for PII data or that making sure that like any type of governance or compliance rules are not being violated. Um, so just like we run the test for code, we can actually uh, deploy the same type of tests for the data itself. Um, and for the function itself, for the code itself, um, with LLMs, it's pretty hard to build something that's fully deterministic. Um, it has some inherent randomness and noise within that. Um, so we have to take that under account. So I, I guess one important thing that uh, we should care about is wherever there's a random function, we want to be able to be able to control the seed that's being used and to be able to reproduce that as well and to store that in Git. Um, we want to think about temperature. Um, it's OK uh, to add some form of noise or randomness into the process as long as we have the means of actually capturing that noise. All right, so if I ask the same question, I might get, get a slightly different um, answer for that. Um, but it should at least be similar, right? I don't want something that's completely off. 
And luckily for us, we have a vector database. We can do similarity search in that. Um, and last, it's not just the code and the data. It's also the environment we're running. Um, if we're already using Kubeflow, that means we're more than halfway there. Um, but everything else regarding our requirements TXT, right, the, the dependencies we're using, Terraform on how we provision the cluster and how we, it's being configured, anything we can capture about that run uh, for us to be able to reproduce that later, we probably want to do. Um, yeah, so kind of last words. This is not specific to LLMs, right? These are just general best practices that just happen to be very useful here. So keeping our components loosely coupled, right? We changed from S3 to LakeFS. That wasn't a big deal. We changed from CLI to Kubeflow. Uh, that was also pretty easy. We want to make sure we're able to do that. We want a single source of truth, both for the data and for the code. Um, and we want to make sure that we're versioning the entire stack, right? Code, data, and environment. And with that, I'm done. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. So thank you. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes for questions. There are two mics set up, so folks, if you have any questions. Yeah. So I have one. Um, w would this also work for another use case, which is um, this for reproducibility, which is great. Would it also work for uh, debugging of like complex uh, pipelines or training? and just going back to intermediate steps and, and doing things like snapshots and stuff Yeah, like. that's a very good question. So for debugging specifically, um, one pattern that we see a lot is branching out at the beginning of a pipeline, running the entire pipeline on its own isolated branch, and then merging everything back atomically. This way, let's say your pipeline touches five different data sources and you failed after three. All this happens on its own isolated branch. Now you have a snapshot of exactly what the world looks like when the failure happened. Debug it, change it, do whatever you want. Main is untouched at that point. Right? You have the freedom to do that. Typically, this is hard because the world just keeps moving. And by the time you end up debugging it, a bunch of things already changed. So this makes it much easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. So um, say you have two books that are pretty similar, have a pretty similar story, and you're having problems with it getting to the right, like you're expecting it that it should be looking at one story and it goes to the other. Are there any techniques you can use to kind of try and fine tune that and make sure it's, like you already talked about the one document. Should you, the follow-up question might be that same document instead of, you know. So if you, yeah, if you have similar things, is there ways to keep it focused on one or something like that? I don't know if that's a good way of wording the question. Yes, so I think uh, it depends on a few things. First of all, uh, in some cases, you might want to introduce some variability into that. Right? So you want to be able to get information from all the different documents that you have. Um, some databases allow you to set weights, uh, or at least to control what, what's being like, pushed up so that answers are more like, geared towards those data sets. But generally, I would say like, if you're feeding data uh, and passing it into a model, you are going to expect that it will come back. So just behave accordingly. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, I also have a quick question around, uh, so what happens when I want to contest the output of a particular model and trace it back to a particular uh, data node where it, which caused the incorrect output? How do I go like trace back? Yeah, that's a very good question. So first of all, on the application side, make sure you're logging everything. Um, typically, your like, RAG pipeline is not receiving thousands of requests per second. This should be pretty trivial to do. Um, from there, I would recommend whatever you're storing in that vector database, make sure it also comes with a canonical ID that you can trace back to the origin document. And when you do that, also pass the reference. Right, and then I can say, OK, someone got a, a bad response. I know that this is this document and that it's coming from V2, which is currently production. And there you have the full chain. And with LakeFS, you can also like, do a blame and say, this file was introduced by that person at that time. Here's the commit message. And so you get like, a full lineage of everything. Absolutely. Thanks for that. Yeah, we have time for one more, I guess. I'll just pass the mic. Yeah, this can be the last question. <laughs> Hello. Um, sorry, I might have missed it, but uh, where was Kubeflow in this whole uh, the thing? Yeah. 
So that's a good question. This is Kubeflow, pipeline.py. I, I initially thought about also doing it as part of the demo, but just adding one more like RPC into the conference Wi-Fi here, I just imagine it will go bad. Um, and the idea here is that once you codify how you execute the pipeline, and like you have these parameters as part of like your Git actions workflow, and only once like you merge to main, this gets executed, then you know exactly which parameters you passed and also which data you were using. Right? And Kubeflow lets you kind of codify the entire process of that. 